Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Uh, good afternoon, even good morning and good evening to everybody, because we are, I know uh, the participants are all from different time zones. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Thank you so much for finding time to join with us for this uh, very exciting uh, webinar on millets. Um, without wasting much time, because there's a lot of exciting things to hear from our two experts, Dr. Paul and uh, Chef Manisha. So let me just quickly uh, introduce to you um, Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul Newman is the director of the SDG2 Advocacy Hub, which works to achieve SDG2 and also bring together NGOs, advocacy groups, civil societies, the private sector and the UN agencies together to in one platform to share the expertise, ideas, and to collaborate on campaigns. He is also the coordinator of the Chef's Manifesto. So you can see on in his background, uh, a banner of the Chef's Manifesto. So thank you very much, uh, Paul, for uh, joining us and over to you. Well, thank you so much for the warm introduction, uh, Chuba. It, it's really great to be a part of this webinar series to highlight the importance of the International Year of Millets. It's wonderful to see that India has spearheaded this International Year of Millets in 2023, as declared by the United Nations. And I'm also incredibly delighted to be joined by Chef Manisha Basan, um, because the best way to bring what I say to life is directly on your plates. So I'm really looking forward to the recipes and hearing from her as a chef working with millets, um, a, a little bit of her insight. Millets, believe it or not, provide a lot of opportunities to address some of the world's most pressing issues linked to food security, nutrition, and the overall food system. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about feeding the world with millets in the context of the global climate and given the potential impact millets have for promoting sustainable food that is good for people and planet. So just to set the scene, we're facing many global challenges at unprecedented levels at the moment. We have a challenge around health. We have a food crisis that's threatening to reverse decades of progress on hunger and malnutrition, pushing us to urgently transform our food systems to nourish both people and planet. We've seen a continued rise in, in the world hunger, 828 million in 2021, while at the same time, 3.1 billion across the world cannot afford a healthy diet. We also have obesity and overweight um, in a world that is not enabling us um, to see progress, as well as at the same time tackling stunting and wasting. And at the same time, there's also a cost of living crisis. You know, we see many people that have fallen into poverty as a direct consequence of global food and energy price surges. The world's still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and many communities as a result are, are facing this cost of living crisis at a time which is quite challenging. We also see global conflict happening in different places that's putting challenge on supply chains. This is pushing up food, fuel and fertilizers and it, it really pushes the cost of food to all time highs. At the same time, climate is a big issue as well and uh, we know that uh, we, we produce enough food to feed the planet, but we also see a third of all food is wasted and a third of some of our greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. We've also got massive issues around water, um, water usage and, and, and water shortages in certain parts of the world. And so finding solutions that can help us um, really look at people and planet are really critical. There's really no other way to put it, but we've been actually off track to reach Sustainable Development Goal 2. Um, and this means uh, we're still at the moment looking at nearly 10% of the world's population is going to face hunger in 2030 if our current trajectory continues. It is a, a little bit grim. And I, 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 as I share this, it, it, it can sometimes get a bit overwhelming. But we also have solutions at hand. We have things that are tangible, that simple solutions that we can then help to move forward. So the question that I often uh, think about is how can we improve what people are eating and how that food is grown that has a positive impact on the planet? And I think millets offer a really great solution and need to be part of the discussion. Putting millets on the map is not just about making the crop more desirable and tasty, 
It's part of a larger effort to achieve the sustainable development goals. So when we think about millets, they're often described as a smart food, good for people, the planet and farmers. Millets encompass a diverse group of small grain dryland cereals, including foxtail, barnyard and fornio, among others. As whole grains, millets are a good source of essential nutrients. Their millets are primarily grown in Asia and Africa, with India being the top producer, followed by Nigeria, Niger, and China. They are among the first plants to be domesticated and still serve as a traditional staple crop in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. These crops are rooted in ancient cultures and ancestral, ancestral traditions and have long survived harsh growing conditions. Their climate resilience and adaptability offer opportunities for strengthening food security and bolstering economic growth. In, in fact, they hold the power to address multiple global issues from malnutrition to climate smart agriculture. With the International Year of Millets, the UN calls for the urgent need to raise awareness of this climate resilient uh, grain and the benefits and to advocate for a diversified, balanced and healthy diets through the increased sustainable production and consumption of millets. The International Year of Millets contributes to the United Nations uh, agenda for sustainable development, particularly through Goal 2, um, Zero Hunger, through Goal 3, Good Health and Wellbeing, Goal 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, Goal 12, Around Responsible Consumption and Production, um, and Goal 13, Around Climate Action, and SDG 15 on, on Life on Land. So if you think about it, what makes millets so special and how do they contribute? So Millets support climate resilient agriculture and they're climate friendly. They use 70% less water than rice. They grow in half the time of wheat. They need 40% less energy and processing. They're very hardy and they can withstand extreme heat conditions. They're nutritious. They have many vitamins and minerals, including iron and calcium. They are high in protein, antioxidants, resistant starch, and have a low glycemic index, which can help prevent or manage diabetes. They're also gluten-free. And as a whole grain, millets provide different amounts of fiber that, uh, which has a role in re regulating bowel function, blood sugar and lipids and, and, and satiation. Um, so millets have this potential to um, really generate livelihoods, increase farmers' incomes and ensure uh, food and nutritional security all over the world. The production of millets and the demand uh, for them has declined as other cereals such as wheat, maize and rice became a dietary pre a preference. So what we're trying to see in this international year is how do you regain market opportunities, look at revenue that can be created for smallholders and boost economic growth. And so we're hoping that greater trade in millets can really also improve the diversity of the global food system. Um, really millets, including sorghum, um, account for 3% of the global grains trade with the need to improve the resilience of global trade and the ability to respond to such changes in the food grain market. Millets are a viable option to increase output diversity and mitigate some of the risks related to production shocks. So I think we have this unlimited untapped potential in these ancient grains. So not only do the benefits I've already explained, but they're also um, ingrained, and there's no pun intended, in a rich cultural history. Millets have said to be among the earliest, if not actually the first cereals to have been cultivated by mankind. Uh, for many years around the world, millets have been a staple food, part of everyday meals. Um, according to studies, more than 19 million people in Africa and Asia depend on millets in their diet. And although global millet consumption has declined in the past, it really does show pop -pop promising trends in the future. There's a, a variety of millets we've got here on the screen that we have to choose from. To name a few, there's finger millet, kodo millet, pearl millet, foxtail millet, and the list goes on. I, I, I don't know exactly which one of my favorite. There's so many. I was talking about this with Chef just before we came on the call. It really does depend a little bit on which dish you're creating and how you bring it together. And they all have uh, amazing benefits. It's really amazing that one tiny grain can give so much. Um, each millet has the an importance of its own. Some millets, such as finger millet, are full of calcium. Um, some, like uh, joa, are potassium and phosphorus, and foxtail is fibrous, while kodo is rich in iron. So you can actually um, use different millets in different ways to give different benefits. 
And when we experience biodiversity loss at an alarming rate, we need group grains like millets to bring this alternative nutritious options. So I think we need to raise awareness uh, to excite people about these kinds of foods that are good for people, planet and prosperity, while also offering solutions which are affordable, accessible and available to all. We really need to encourage better farming practices. Planting diverse crops is better for the soil and crop diversification is better to navigate climatic stresses. We need to do all of this while keeping in mind affordability, access to food and also taste and flavour. The International Year of Millets is an opportunity to highlight the benefits of millets for better production, better nutrition, a better environment and a better life. Millets offer a solution which hits all of the targets. I think everyone has a role from government, private sector companies to the general public and even young people. And we need to work together to unleash the potential of millets. I've seen in my work over the past year, some really great opportunities to showcase the power of millets and looking at millets in all kinds of different ways. I had here, um, there's, there's a, different products. This is a product that has millets in pancake mix um, from Millet, you know. Um, there's lots of different ideas like this that are coming out to make millets more accessible and more available. I've got friends that have been doing things with Funio and different al other elements. And so it's really excited to see some of the developments that are happening, to see some of the ways that people are doing things. So I want to thank you for your attention um, I look forward to the next part of the segment where we get to see um, Chef in action, bringing these grains to life and really uh, talking to us about how they can really come into recipes. So thank you and uh, looking forward to other Q&A. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul, for the very inspiring talk and also for in very insightful uh, inputs on millets. Chef Manisha has been, uh, since 1996, she has planned her dishes around various local food. So she's in a way a sustainable food champion. And in her career spanning more than 30 years, uh, she has promoted energy efficiency, green practices, and the use of local ingredients um, in multiple cuisines. So over to you, Chef Manisha. Thank you. Thank you, Chuba. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. That was a very interesting session, uh, what I heard your take on the millet. And thank you, uh, Mata, for having me here. Uh, very interesting topic. And this is something which has been very close to my heart for many, many years. And I'm so glad that this is the year of millet uh, declared by UN, of course, by supported and nudge uh, by, by the Indian government also. So in India, we are doing a lot of interesting work. Uh, where as far as millets are concerned. So as we dive deeper into the millet, we realized that the uh, millets were very much part of our diets till 1960, you know, and as the green revolution came in, uh, what Dr. Paul also mentioned earlier, as the wheat and the rice took over, which, which consumes a lot of water, uh, and it is a little more easier to cook, the millets gradually started fading away from our diets. So today, uh, the chefs in India and across the world have taken it over themselves to, to bring back the millet in their diet, not only in the traditional way, but also make it more interesting and perhaps add on to the new way of cooking, which perhaps will uh, be more appealing to the millennials as well. So that has been our endeavor. And the recipe that I'm going to show today, which is actually quite challenging to do a recipe on webinar, but uh, I have tried to make it as interesting as possible. So I have picked up a very uh, uh, traditional age-old recipe from India, uh, which is called halim, which is a savory porridge for ease of explanation. Uh, normally it is made with lamb or chicken, but we have replaced that with jackfruit. Again, jackfruit is uh, very nutritious and uh, again, highly, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's grown in huge quantity in India and in Asian countries as well. So I thought that would be a great alternate. But of course, before I start the recipe, uh, one, one, when one wants to make it at home, you can replace it with lamb or chicken as well. Or you can use chickpea or you can use blended vegetables. So this is just an indication how we want to go forward with that. And towards end of my recipe, I have taken actual real-time pictures of what we have been doing at ITC hotels uh, on, under the Mission Millet program where we have introduced various programs on the breakfast 
as well as lunches and dinner buffets as well. And the response has been very, very heartening. So I'll just share my screen now. Okay, so this is the, this is various kinds of millets that we have available in India and what we have been using. But Dr. Paul also just light on whether it's amaranth, sorghum, uh, quinoa, barley, porso, rye, buckwheat, and multiple things. What I was just discussing, my favorite being sorghum and pearl millet, uh, because it it has it is very versatile. And what the the screen that you see on your left hand side is various millet preparations and real time millets which are there. Um, this is various preparation in Indian, in Western, and in Asian that we do in our hotels across not only ITC, other hotels also are following this. Uh, so millet is growing. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a growing inclination of urban population towards healthy food in Asia Pacific. Because of that, now there's a lot of interest in the millets. Uh, it also helps in increasing uh, the less uh, consumption of rice and wheat, which follows unsustainable uh, methods to produce it. And millet grows easily in a drier climate with a smaller harvesting period. In terms of nutritional property, they are superior to certain highly consumed cereals like rice and wheat. Uh, like, it's, like it was mentioned earlier, they are very rich in calcium, iron, and fiber and helps to fortify essential nutri nutrients for uh, young children. Uh, these are photo insensitive, that means they grow very well in summer as well and highly resilient to climate change and also have very low carbon and water footprint. Uh, I'll move on to my recipe here. The recipe is a multi-millet uh, uh, multi uh, halim made with jackfruit and spices. Now halim started actually in Arabic country and it traveled towards India way back in way back in 1100 uh, AD. And it is made with sorghum, pearl millet, white urad dal, raw jackfruit. Like I mentioned earlier, raw jackfruit can be replaced with chickpea or mixed vegetable or uh, meat and chicken as well. So if you're a veg non-vegetarian, you can have it. And the re it comes out very well when you make it with lamb. So I'll just put a small video, which will talk, which will show the various ingredients which are there. Uh, these are the ingredients, which is the turmeric, the cardamom, the star anise, garam masala, all spice. Uh, I was told earlier that there is going to be a booklet that is going to be printed. So all these recipes will also be there and also will be available online. So uh, I will go on to the next slide here. So step one is you soak the millet overnight. And next morning, boil the sorghum, pearl millet, cashew nuts, and urad dal in excess water till all are cooked. Now, these, what you see, sorghum, these are soaked, washed, soaked, and then pounded. And then they are being boiled right now. Uh, you mix the two millet, urad dal, which is a lentil, a white lentil, and cashew nut and grind to a coarse paste. Now, these millet, you need not necessarily use only these these three millets. You can replace it with other millets as well. Or you can use barley or whatever is available in your country. Uh, Dr. Paul was just mentioning the pancake and millet mix, which is available. If you have, if you have a millet flour, you can tweak the recipe and add the flour towards the end of the recipe. Right now, I have used the millet per se as in seed and which is totally unprocessed. But if in your country you don't get millet in even in a dried form, it is available in a powder form or a flour form, you can do, it's very versatile. You can use it in any which way you need. Only idea is that when you're using millet in your food, uh, don't get guided by using 100% millet. If it's a challenge for you to even make pancakes, for example, with millet, you can fortify your pancake mixture by mixture by using half of refined flour and half of multi-millet flour. At least you're still absorbing millet to a certain extent in your diet and gradually introduce to your diets rather than doing it 100%, which sometimes uh, may not be very acceptable in the to the palate. This is the processing of the jackfruit. We are cutting the jackfruit, marinate the jackfruit with salt and half of the ginger garlic paste and green chili paste for 30 minutes. If you find green chili paste very spicy, you can always drop it. 
you don't get jackfruit, you can replace it with chickpeas or you can add assorted green vegetables, whatever you have, you and potato for a little binding. You can have beans, you can have cauliflower, broccoli, process it the same way and add it to your, uh, to your porridge, the, the savory porridge that I'm talking about. Uh, heat the oil in a frying pan. In India, we use a lot of ghee. Ghee is uh, made from milk fat. It's a, it's a refined butter, uh, which is uh, used a lot in our food. Uh, you heat the oil in a frying pan and shallow fry the marinated jackfruit or whatever vegetable you have marinated on slow heat until cooked. Drain the excess oil away and once cool, pull apart the jackfruit like a pulled, pulled lamb or pulled chicken or whatever we do. You pull the jackfruit also into smaller strands. Then we, so the vessel that I have also used, in India, the metallurgy plays a very major role. The metal, the kind of vessel we use, it works a lot. So this is a very heavy bottom pan made of copper. It also adds value, to, nutritional value to the food. That's the essential elements come into your food. So this is a very traditional vessel that's been used. So you heat ghee in a copper pan, add the cardamom, cinnamon, star anise, and bay leaf, allow to crackle, Add the remaining ginger, garlic, and chili paste and saute. Add the powdered spices, which is the turmeric, the garam masala, the coriander powder, and cook on medium heat for a few minutes with sprinkling of water in intervals to avoid burning of spices. Uh, if you don't have certain ingredients, don't, don't, don't worry. Replace it with what you have at home or what you have in your pantry. Trust me, it'll come out well. The idea is to add millets to your daily diets. Uh, add the boiled sorghum pearl millet cashew that you have we have done earlier. Paste mixture to this for, to this masala that we have sauteed. If you don't have these spices, you can just crackle some some cumin and add add your uh, boiled millets to this. Uh, add the pulled vegetable or jackfruit and fold it well. Season with salt. Now cook on a very low heat for approximately thirty minutes while stirring gently in intervals with a wooden spoon. Why wooden spoon? Because we don't want too much of scraping to happen across. It's typical that the, the very reason why we use the, why we use the uh, non-stick uh, uh, for the backlight. Cook on a very low heat for approximately 30 minutes while stirring gently in intervals. Add brown onions, chopped coriander and mint and finish with ghee. Ghee is very important in Indian diet. Uh, of course, there are a lot of studies also, and even USDA today says that ghee is good for health. You must have it. Uh, finally, cook until it turns brown and thick. And by this point, it will release the ghee that, and it will be a it will be a blend. It will be a gel of whole thing. That is uh, that's how it's uh, it comes together. Uh, you finish with coriander, mint leaf, and have it. Uh, this is the assembling that we are doing here. So if when you make it with lamb also, it comes out brilliantly well. Add fried brown, onion flavors, mint and coriander sprigs and a lemon. It's a, it's a meal in itself. It's a complete meal. You don't need any bread with it. You don't need anything. It has healthy fats. It has essential uh, Protein, vitamin with the vegetable there. And uh, it's a whole meal with protein there. So enjoy the millet. The next slide I have is this is these are some real time pictures that we have been introducing in our hotel. This was just to give a over just an overview of how millet can be added to international food preparations also. The first picture that you see is a millet yogurt breakfast bowl. Earlier, when we had marinated the millets. Uh, we had actually washed and soaked and boiled the millet. You can use that millet after boiling it to your breakfast bowl. A pearl millet works wonderfully well in this. It's, it's a great way to have it. Even amaranth, which is Dr. Paul's favorite too, works brilliantly well. Amaranth is, uh, renders very well to, uh, to a breakfast bowl. Uh, like we typically, you would add pumpkin seed or alm almonds or whatever to your breakfast cereal. You add the soaked boiled millet to your bowl. It'll, it'll, it's a great way to have millet. You can make a salad. 
It is sorghum and avocado salad with the millet crisp. So we typically you just take the millet, boil it, uh, make it into a paste, uh, put it on a baking sheet, and then make it slow, slow bake it, crisp it. That's the crisp that comes to the salad, and just toss it up. If you keep millets, uh, preferably whichever millet you you like or you get in the market, keep it boiled uh, in in your fridge and add on to your whatever dish you have. That's a great way to incorporate and fortify your diets with millet. This is the pancake that we were talking about earlier. In this, uh, we have 50% millet flour. We have ragi here and 50% of refined flour in this we have added. So because of the texture, millet does not have gluten as we discussed earlier as well. So the texture is a little, little tricky to get. It renders very well to porridge kind of a consistency. But when you try to make a bread out of it, or you want to make a pancake, initially to start with, my recommendation would be that you start by augmenting it with little flour, whatever flour you are used to, whether it's a rice flour or whole wheat flour or a refined flour for that matter. So that your preparation is wholesome, you are taking millet in some way or the other, adding to your diets. The next picture you see here is the sorghum millet tacos. It is uh, sorghum uh, renders very well to rolling, very well to baking. You don't need to fortify that with any flour or anything that you need to add. You just uh, make a dough, like you typically you would do a, do a dough for any tortilla or in Indian context, a roti. You roll it and uh, you lightly bake it on a flat griddle or in the oven and you shape it and you add on whatever filling you add, want to add to that. And the next one is a little millet flake crusted fish and chips. Fish and chips is everybody's favorite. You can't go wrong. So it's a kutki millet. Again, one of my favorite. Actually, I do a very good, we do a very interesting Indian preparation also, which is again potato and a little millet uh, uh, vegetable preparation that we do. In this case, we instead of crusting with the breadcrumb, which is gluten, we've crusted it with the soaked kutki, uh, soaked little millet. And then, then process the fried fish the way one would do at home. Uh, the last one you see is the Asian curry bowl with the millet fried rice. So there's no rice in this. It is just the millet which is there. It is a pearl millet, the pearl millet which is again soaked and boiled. And you process it like a fried rice. It's a vegetable fried rice. You can have an egg fried rice or whatever you would like to have. Uh, so again, a great wholesome meal on its own. Uh, the reason I'm sharing these pictures with you is for just to for the audience to know how versatile millet can be. You just need to replace it wherever you're using rice, wherever you're using flour, you just replace it with millet and, uh, and the dish is there, it's right there. Here we have a millet crusted baked cheesecake. So in a cheesecake, typically one would put a biscuit crust. In this, we put a multi-millet crust. So we just take a multi-millet flour, which is, which is available in other countries as well. You process it with, uh, with, with butter, with shortening, make a short crust with that and, and bake it blind and then process your, the way you would do cheesecake. Uh, this is a pearl millet savory tart. In this, the crust is of a multi-millet flour and inside also we have put a pearl millet. And this is a multi-millet baguette. Uh, again, 50 ratio is 50% flour and 50% millet. That is what we have done in this because like I said, Breads are difficult to crack with just pure 100% millet. But yes, instead of adding refined flour, you can, add, uh, you can add the whole wheat flour or you can add rice flour and then you have to add xanthan and multiple other things. But one will have to, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trial and error actually. That's how one comes up across with these breads because India, the country has been eating millets in a very traditional form. So these are the, this is some of the work that we have done over last six, eight months to come up with new dishes which are introduced in our, in our buffets, in our hotels across India. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay, you. This is one more slide. So this is, the, this is the Indian preparation that we have here. The millet haleem that we just saw, it's the same thing what we see here. The Indian spices. This is the Indian spiced millet dumpling, which is a kuni paniyaram, and a millet beetroot kebab. Again, it is a beetroot mix with the millet is added to this, the boiled millet is added to it for the body and it's pan grilled. Yeah. So thank, thank you, Chuba. Thank you, Dr. Paul. 
thank, thank you, you very uh, much. to the viewers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chef Besin, for sharing with us this wonderful recipe. And my mouth is already watering. I just can't wait to get all of the full recipe and start making something. So we are very much looking forward to it. Um, so thank you. And uh, thanks uh, to Chef, could you kindly stop sharing the screen? Yeah, I you... just... yeah thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. 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 So we have a couple of questions we have received. In fact, now I can see more questions. So um, first, let me just see the first question. The first question is from Karima Singh. Uh, I think this is to uh, Dr. Paul. So the question is, how can we inspire and cultivate a genuine inclination among today's youth to choose and appreciate nutritious alternatives like millets or product, products like uh, I think you mentioned amidst the dominance of junk food in our modern era? Yeah, look, um, it's a great question. And I think there's lots of different ways that, that tend to be able to help on this. So you do have um, education can play a role in helping people to understand uh, what are the health benefits. So it depends on where the youth are and, and exactly what, what sort of motivations they have. But um, understanding and working to help them understand, you know, where ingredients come from, the impact they have on people and planet goes a long way helping them to understand the health benefits is key. But I also think one of the other things that we've learned is that it, people don't often make decisions just based on education. They make decisions on what tastes good, on how it's presented to them. And so if, for example, chef is putting in front of them a whole range of dishes, people are inspired by what they smell, what they taste, you know, what they see. Um, and so I think it's also about presenting it in an exciting way um, so that is desirable. And I think this is sometimes the challenge is, you know, it can be through integrating the product into other products that they're already eating. So, you know, a cheesecake or a, um, other kinds of products, um, you know, we've seen on salads or in, uh, uh, you know, burger alternatives, things like this, you know, you can utilize the grain in so many different ways, you know, with porridge, for example, um, you know, these kinds of breakfast so you're getting grain into things that people eat. They then develop a taste for the flavor. Then you can educate them on the benefits. But I think the starting point is to make them desirable. I also think there's a convenience question, which is about how accessible are they? A lot of the reason why people choose um, foods which are maybe not as good for them is because they're very convenient. And I think that's where, you know, for example, the 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 millet kind of model people that are busy working they don't want to go and buy the grain and work it out all the detail maybe on the weekend but they also need those quick alternatives or those quick recipes and so i think it's a it's a mixture of like looking at desirability um helping them to understand the benefits once they they start to taste and engage but then also looking at the convenience factors of how do you actually make this easy for people to make these choices Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we have another very interesting question here, uh, and I would like to direct this to Chef Manisha. Any special way to eat millets as daily routine? Is this lighter on stomachs than regular grains? Can people with celiac disease eat millets? Um, millet uh, definitely is, uh, there is a special, not a special way you can incorporate in your daily diet, like Dr. Paul also just mentioned that we have to make it accessible, make it easier for people to add to their food and more acceptable. But remember, we are competing with, with the era of rice and wheat, which has had, has had hold on the population for so many years. Uh, and to, so to get people to accept millet in daily diet, it is very important to make it more tastier, uh, make it less cumbersome. The ease of putting it together has to be kept in mind. So that's why I said that, you know, you, you boil the millet, keep it in your fridge and use it as a replacement wherever you're using rice. Uh, you have to look at it very creatively. Uh, yes, but what you must do is you must alternate between the millets. In India, what we call, uh, there's no, uh, I don't think there's any English equivalent to that. That is the tasir. That means the effect that food has on your body, depending on the season that you've had. It is not that, that every millet you can have around the year. 
there are certain millets which have heating property and certain millets which are cooling. So one must remember that that you know if it is if it is sorghum you should have it in in summer. If it is uh, bajra then you must have it in uh, winter uh, because that is heating property. This is cooling property. So that is something that has has to be kept in mind and one should alternate between the millets uh, uh, don't get uh, don't get used to a certain one kind of a millet i feel that is my recommendation so that you can um, you can digest the millet you cannot get used to one kind of millet where your digestion will uh, may not be able to handle it well so that is very important and yes millet is gluten free it is 100% uh, uh, acceptable for celiac and it's a great alternative for that. Okay, thank you, Chef. Uh, there is another question. Um, let me uh, direct this question to Dr. Paul. Uh, question by Shweta Sharma. Sir, how millets can serve as food security provision for developing and underdeveloped countries? Yeah, so I think... Um, one of the things that I've heard a little bit about is um, traditionally millets were used when crops maybe had a bad season. So when there was a, a failure of a, of a crop at some point due to weather or climate coming at the wrong time, millets were often used because of their shorter growing cycle. And so they were used to plant when a crop failed to actually then ensure that people had something to eat. So I think there's there's an element here with smallholder farmers um, that, you know, how could you actually utilize millets as, as integrated as part of a broader system to actually um, supplement and to support the diversity on the farm? Um, because, the, because of that, I think it, it enables then the, uh, you know, in this kind of changing climate where we're seeing more and more crops fail because of weather events, um, water shortages, heat waves, these kinds of things. You're seeing then a, a shorter cycle, which enables people to um, look at that. I also think it's about how do we um, think about, you know, the role of women in, in farming. You know, the majority of farming around the world is done by women. Um, and I think, you know, uh, empowering female producers to be able to look at different millet uh, varieties, I think is also really, um, really important. And so, how do we use, how do we look at doing that in, in the right kind of way? You know, I think the hardiness of the crop as well is key because I think, you know, as this weather changes, it's a way of helping us to kind of have options and choices. Um, and then I also think the nutrition or benefit because of the nutritional benefits and densities, you also get more bang for your buck kind of thing. It's like, it's more, you get more nutrition than some other crops that maybe don't have that nutrition density. So I think, you know, in smaller areas where countries have got land pressure, they've got this, this is also another benefit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, for Paul, for that. Um, I'm going to combine two questions, one by Dawal and the other one by Ajok. Uh, and I'm going to direct this to Chef Manisha. Uh, the question is, is there any side effect of eating millets daily? Should there be another change? Uh, any other change one should adapt with change in the grain? And the other question is, how can we add millets in to, into the modern culinary concept? So uh, to first to answer your uh, first part of the question, uh, there is no side effect in having millets daily. Uh, in India, uh, for centuries, you know, the farmer before he would go to the uh, before he go to the field in the morning, he would have in the south of India they would have ragi mudde. In Rajasthan, they would have bajra ki roti. So they've been having it for for centuries together, and there is no there is no side effect of having it. Only thing I was stressing upon was that you must remember what season are you, which if you are having it in summer, which millet you must have, and in winter, which millet must you have, because of its efficacy on the body for absorption. Uh, if you have, like I said, if you have sorghum in 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 winter, it is cooling. It's a cooling millet. Its its efficacy on your body, its effectivity on your body is cooling. So that may not be a great option. Not that it's going to harm you. But there are other millets which are good for you to have in winter. That is something that one must keep in mind. Uh, coming to the next part of your question, uh, which was, uh, 
should there be any change one should adapt for in the grain um, you can you should actually try to explore as much as possible you know i'm i'm talking about india in particular as a country where there is such a huge wealth of millet there's so many varieties of millet there are certain varieties of millet which are available in himachal pradesh or in the hills to what is available in the plains to what is available in the southern part of india so one should be able to explore that and and maybe revisit the traditional recipes also and see how your forefathers have had these millets in their diets like whatever repertoire i have been able to uh, put together collectively has been by visiting these you know by visiting the elderly people by asking the grandparents asking them what they used to eat do what do how do they remember when they were growing up how they were eating millets in their diets and one has tried to incorporate that um the last part of your question in the modern culinary concept yes it is very important uh we have to because if we want millets to be part of the future generations diet it is very important for us to also have uh, add that to the modern cuisine as well and a lot of work has been happening on that by a lot of chefs uh you we do do multi grain uh, we do do multi millet pizzas we do millet dim sums uh we do millet noodles uh i you see other company has come up with millet was all the kids want is that ready made noodle um which is kind of becoming a cup of noodle can be any brand uh so why don't you replace it with millet make it more acceptable to the younger generation so that when they grow up uh, as a habit they will look for the millet preparation uh what the the recipes that i showed where we had crusted the uh we had crusted the fish with the millet that's again another option or we had made the cheesecake crust with millet that was another option so one can explore one has to explore this uh and yes there are a lot of recipes now one is coming up with which i have the which have the modernistic twist to it as well okay thank you very much chef and uh i know there are a number of questions here but uh we we are very strict with time so time is already up now so i will have we will have to uh, bring to a close to this session i would li like to thank uh, both our resource person uh, dr paul as well as chef manisha for sharing wonderful insights uh, on on millets and we've learned a lot and also i would uh, like to thank all the participants uh, especially for your active participation and for sharing your questions and comments and some of the questions uh, we we have already uh, you know answered in the chat box and um, we do hope that you will continue to join us in the uh, in the future so um, thank you for joining us today and this is the as i said earlier this is the first in the series of three webinars so please do join us again on 7th july which is the next webinar to learn about the role of millets in climate resilience and environmental stewardship so you can get the full details um, there's already details are in uh, marta has already posted in the uh, chat box so you can do that so thank you very much for joining us once again and see you on 7th july thank you thank you so much